Have you ever been at a party or a networking event? You meet someone, they introduce themselves, and they say, hi, my name's Abigail. And then 10 seconds later, you realize that you cannot remember their name. You have no idea what their name is. And then you spend the rest of the night just kind of avoiding it, hoping that someone else says their name out loud so that you can remember it. And you just end up feeling kind of awkward and dumb. And that's what this video is all about. We're gonna give you the tools to overcome and prevent this type of thing from happening in the future. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl. I'm a US Navy trained psychiatrist and the founder of Tech for Psych and what I call the Stay Sharp Mental Fitness Program. I've spent the last decade teaching people how to improve brain performance through tools like meditation, visualization, and using wearable neurotechnology. And most people don't realize that there's actually two parts to this problem of remembering names and places and words. You have to have both memory and attention to accomplish this. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to train both. We'll start with a quick proven visualization trick to help you remember names almost instantly. And then I'll show you how to use Neurotech like the Muse headband to train your attention and mindfulness. That way you're actually present when these names are said in the first place. And then you can use the memory techniques to remember them later. And if this is interesting to you and you want to stay informed about different techniques that we talk about here on the channel, be sure to subscribe because we have a lot more tips and training coming every week to keep your mind sharp for decades. Now let's talk about these memory techniques and why something called visual memory actually works. Most of us were not ever told how memory actually works. We just assume that it's all about repetition, doing flashcards, or if someone's really good at memory, they've got a photo graphic memory, or maybe it's just their pure raw intelligence that can remember things. But neuroscience is telling us something different. It turns out that our brains are totally wired for imagery. And even more so, they are well wired for novel imagery or ridiculous imagery. Aristotle once said, it's impossible to think without a picture. We know that the brain remembers visuals far more easily than abstract concepts. And in order to kick that up to the next level, doing bizarre, emotional, or exaggerated images in your mind activates brain systems that prioritize memory even better. If you think of something ridiculous, like, I don't know, a giant cucumber serving you a cheeseburger, this is going to boost emotional relevance. The hippocampus encodes the long-term memory better, and something called the locus ceruleus that's involved with learning ends up releasing a bunch of norepinephrine, which is a neurochemical that helps you highlight what matters in your life. But as you will see, well, we have some control over this. Studies show that people remember images that are absurd or absurd images 50 to 80% better than plain ones. So if you really wanna lock something into memory, make it emotionally charged or ridiculous. I think, unfortunately, a lot of us remember that terrible day during 9-11, where we were, what we were doing. I was actually at the bus stop. I was in high school at the time, and I remember my friend's mom talking about it. So those images are very clear. I also remember when I got home from school and my mom was watching the TV crying, and man, this is many, many years back, and those images are very vivid. So we know that these emotionally charged memories really stick, but I'll show you how to use the ridiculous imagery to memorize a ton of things. Because luckily for this technique to work, nothing traumatic actually has to happen. You can do it at will. But first I really wanna talk about attention because here's the thing, memory starts with attention. You actually need to be present in order to absorb the information in the first place. One of my favorite books on this topic is Peak Mind by Dr. Amishi Jha out of the University of Miami, where they showed that mindfulness training in active duty soldiers increased their ability to pay attention during stress and have better what's called working memory, which is short term memory to remember things in the moment. During their training, they tended to just perform better overall, be more present, and they actually had higher scores on live fire exercises. Dr. Jha describes attention as the flashlight of the mind. You can only encode what the flashlight is pointing at. 
So if you're at a party and someone introduces themselves, if you're distracted or you're trying to multitask or if you're nervous or self-conscious and you're just paying attention to yourself instead of what's in front of you and being lost in thought, that memory isn't ever going to be captured in the first place. And this is where the mindfulness training and tools like the Muse headband really come in handy. I use the Muse every day during meditation to train my brain. If I'm watching my breath during a meditation session and my mind drifts to thinking about something that I need to do later that day or what happened yesterday or different thoughts about what I want to do in the future, gently bring that focus back to the breath and practice mindfulness. You're training your prefrontal cortex to have control over where your attention is. And over time, this improves something that's really important for memory called original awareness. It's the ability to notice and then encode the information the first time you encounter something. And with that original awareness, because you've trained your mindfulness, you can then take these memory techniques and take the original awareness to an entirely new level. So once you've trained your attention, you're actually ready to remember the name or any other piece of information that you encounter on a daily basis. So let's take the party example. Someone comes up, they introduce themselves, they say, hi, I'm Sandy. In that split second, instead of letting the name just go over your head and slide by and forget it, you wanna anchor it there in the moment. If it's a woman, I'm going to picture her face and just imagine a giant pile of sand being dumped on her head. Is that absurd? Yes. Is it effective? Absolutely. The weirder the image, the stronger that memory is going to be. There's some awesome books on this. There's Moonwalking with Einstein about a guy who became a memory champion with these techniques. Uh, there's the memory book, which really breaks these techniques into you know, different styles so that you can do everything from remembering names to events to even credit card numbers. What I'm talking about with this visualization with Sandy during the party is what Harry Lorraine, the author of this book, calls the link system. The idea is that you are linking one image to the next in order to enhance your memory, and you're linking the images through action, exaggeration, or substitution in ridiculous ways that help you remember them. To demonstrate this, let's try to memorize a list of objects. All right, here come the object names. Are you ready for them? Airplane, tree, envelope, sing, basketball, salami, star, and nose. Do you think that you could remember all those off the top of your head if I asked you in two or three days? Probably not, but with this memory technique, I guarantee that you're going to remember this now. So here's how I would go about linking these. I just imagine there's an airplane sitting there on the tarmac, but there's this ridiculous part of it where there are trees that are passengers that are walking up the walkway to get onto the plane. So I've linked airplane to tree. And then the next thing that happens is the plane takes off and it goes through a giant envelope that's just hovering there in the sky. Then the perspective shifts and you look through the hole in the envelope and you see this person, this woman, just singing at the top of her lungs. You see those sound waves of the singing noise coming out of her mouth and it hits this basketball that's floating up in orbit from the Earth. Because the sound waves are hitting a basketball that's floating there in space, it explodes and in doing so, it turns into a giant piece of salon. That star absorbs the salami and then comes back to Earth and it lands on a sculpture of a nose in a park. I know it's weird, but together here, you and I just created what's called a visual story. It works best if you create your own imagery because you're practicing your own imagination and that's going to stick better. But if you tried to memorize that list in your own way right now and then reviewed it right before you went to bed to allow memory consolidation during sleep to really solidify it, <laughs> You're gonna remember that whole sequence for a week, I guarantee it. And you'll be shocked at how well this works. You can do the linking system with people's names, but where it really came in benefit for me was memorizing things that were abstract to me as I was trying to learn them as an adult in medical school. The novelty of these images is what's called deep processing, and it really makes the memory stick a lot better rather than just trying to repeat a name a bunch of times. This became really apparent to me in medical school. So 10 years ago, I actually wrote a short book that I called Lessons Learned in Medical School, where I talked about using these techniques to memorize things 
in medical school. The problem with a lot of the things that you learn in medical school as an adult is that they're really abstract names. Like take for example, the name for Lexapro, it's an SSRI. The long name for it is escitalopram. How do you memorize escitalopram if you've never heard that word before? Do you just like put it on a flashcard and just do it in repetition again and again and again? I mean, that's what I tried to do in medical school, but it ended up getting to a point at which there was so much to memorize, I just literally couldn't even just rely on my intelligence or my memory skills at that point, like something had to change. And when I learned about these skills and actually started applying them, it actually moved me 50% up the bell curve in terms of all students nationally in medical school and moved me up into the top 25% of students, which is saying something because I do consider myself pretty smart, but there are some ridiculously smart people in medical school when it comes to book smarts. I mean, I was blown away with how little some people actually had to study. But once I learned these memory visualization techniques, things became a lot easier for me. So let's come up with another example that someone might encounter in medical school. I think a really good example of this is in pharmacology because you're trying to remember all these weird medication names like antibiotics that treat different types of bacteria. Not only are the antibiotic names weird, but the names of the bacteria are weird too. You just don't have anything to grasp or lodge your memory onto. So there's a bacteria called Listeria. You might find it in unwashed lettuce, for example. And let's just say someone's got a bad case of being infected with Listeria. The antibiotic that you wanna choose according to the textbook is a combination of ampicillin and gentamicin. Now, if you're fresh into medical school, you probably, maybe you have heard of penicillin before and there's some relationship there with ampicillin, but gentamicin, listeria, these are terms that often people had not encountered before. So the strategy is actually coming up with a visual representation of both listeria and the combination of ampicillin and gentamicin. So the one that I came up with here in the script is listeria. I mean, it sounds like list, so maybe like there's like a grocery list that represents listeria, but there's that also second part, hysteria, iria. Kind of sounds to me like diarrhea, which is good because it's kind of ridiculous, right? So if I imagine in my mind's eye, this list that's sitting on the toilet because it's got diarrhea, you know, that might be a good substitution there. We'll, we'll try it, see if it works. And if it doesn't work well, it doesn't stick in my mind, I can always come up with something different. But let's stick with that for now, okay? Listeria represents this abstract thing like a bacteria, but it's this list sitting on the toilet with diarrhea. Okay, now I need to come up with the visual representation of the antibiotic combination. So there's ampicillin. So I like guitar and I think of guitar amps. So let's, let's use a guitar amp as the ampicillin. And the gentamicin is kind of challenging. So genta, I think of like a gentleman and mice, mycin. So thinking of mice is really concrete there. So maybe there are mice that are kind of gentlemanly. So if you've got the mouse in a tuxedo and he's creating these sound waves from the guitar amp and those are going and hitting the list sitting on the toilet, melting the list and it gets flushed down the toilet. Totally ridiculous but I think that's gonna stick in my mind. Now what's gonna happen over the next couple of days is as I recall it, I'm recalling the ridiculous scene where you've got this mouse in a tuxedo melting the list with his guitar waves. But what ends up happening is eventually you kind of forget the actual visual imagery that you came up with and you just know the fact. It just gets cemented in your long-term memory like a lot of things that we remember from childhood. It's just that during childhood, we were like sponges, right? We just absorb things better. But as adults, especially if you're memorizing vast amounts of information that's new to you, you need association so that your brain can hold on to it, anchor it, and then cement it in long-term memory for recall later. And if you still can't just remember it off the top of your head and you're sitting there during a test and the question is asking you, what do you use to treat listeria? I mean, the second you see that word, ampicillin with gentamicin, those images are going to pop into your head and it's just gonna be extremely obvious. Like, oh yeah, listeria, it's the list. And remember what was affecting the list was that weird mouse playing the guitar and melting it with the sound waves. I mean, it just becomes so obvious to you when you're sitting there doing a multiple choice test that it really makes things a lot easier. 
And you can use this for multiple different things like remembering where you parked your car, uh, everybody's name at the party. And you can even use it to memorize things like long strings of digits like in credit card numbers. It's a little bit more difficult because there's this phonetic system that you have to learn. They talk all about it in the memory book, but there actually is a system where you can break down long strings of numbers into phonetic noises and replace that with images based on the phonetics and be able to memorize long strings of numbers that way. Now beyond the obvious benefit of being able to score high on tests or remember speeches for public speaking, there is an effect on the brain that actually is good in the long term because you're training your imagination. And that's something that we don't tend to do very much as adults. As kids, we used to just play with cardboard boxes, you know, imagine we're going to the moon on a rocket ship. And so their imagination skills are great, but as adults, we get into the routine, novelty is reduced, and we just stop using that muscle very much. But if you use these memory techniques, it's going to force you to train your imagination. And ultimately that's going to keep your brain young and pliable with a lot of neuroplasticity. And just like training your physical fitness, training this mental fitness does take effort and practice. But I think over the years, if you continue to use techniques like this, it'll keep your brain young and sharp for decades to come. You pair it with things like attention training using mindfulness meditation or neurofeedback tools like the Muse, you're not just remembering more, you're training your brain to pay attention and giving it a workout from multiple different angles. So be sure to try this technique now to memorize that list we talked about before. So I really want you to try this. So I'm going to put the list in the description of this video, come up with your own link chain, review it before bed tonight and try to remember it tomorrow morning and notice how well it sticks in your mind. And if you want to take it even further and learn more of these techniques and what we're talking about in my Sharper Every Day program, we dive into memory, focus, and the overall science-backed training of maintaining a sharper mind and brain for years and decades to come. If you wanna learn more about that program, here's a video here describing it, and uh, I'll see you on the other side.